Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I am Charlie Sykes. There are just five days left in Donald Trump's presidency. Washington, D.C. is an armed camp, but hopefully there are moving trucks at the White House. Meanwhile, these new polls are out, indicate the degree to which uh, maybe some things do matter. The Pew poll came out Friday morning showing Donald Trump now with a 29% approval rating, which is stunning. The Washington Post ABC poll came out earlier, a little bit earlier, showing that a majority of Americans and one out of eight Republican voters think that Donald Trump should be criminally charged. Uh, 90% of American voters oppose the storming of the Capitol. We're also getting new details uh, about uh, the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, including a report uh, just a few minutes ago from the Washington Post that the rioters storming the Capitol came very, very dangerously close to Mike Pence. And we're also seeing uh, uh, court filings indicating that some of the rioters, including ex-military members, wanted to capture and assassinate lawmakers. Uh, This is from federal prosecutors. So this seems like a perfect day to talk with our two national security friends, Elizabeth Newman, former senior advisor uh, and deputy chief of staff to the Department of Homeland Security, and Olivia Troy, who was until July Vice President Michael Pence's Homeland Security advisor. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover. Can we just start with this, though? I, I want to play for you a clip of a D.C. police officer named Michael Fanone, I think I'm pronouncing that correct, who describes what it was like, the the battle scene at the Capitol, for anyone who is under any illusions that this was largely peaceful. A great story in the Post about how battered police made this stand against the Capitol mob and compared it to a medieval battle scene. But But here's the story of a guy that came very, very close. This, this, this story makes it very clear how close this came to a even worse tragedy than it was. This is Michael Fanone talking to CNN. I was just, you know, trying to fight as best I could. Uh, I remember, like, guys were stripping me of my gear, these riders uh, pulling my badge off my chest. Um, they ripped my radio off of uh, off my vest started pulling, uh, like, ammunition magazines from their holder uh, on my belt. And then some guys started getting a hold of my gun, and uh, they were screaming out, um, you know, kill him with his own gun. Um, At that point, you know, it was just, like, self-preservation. You know, how do I survive this situation? And I thought about, you know, using deadly force. I thought about shooting people. Um... And then I, I just came to the conclusion that, you know, if I was to do that, you know, I might get a few, but I'm not going to take everybody, and uh, they'll probably take my gun away from me, and that would definitely give them the justification that they were looking for to kill me uh, if they already didn't have made that up in their minds. Uh, so the other option I thought of was, you know, try to appeal to somebody's humanity. Um, and I, I just remember yelling out that I have kids, and uh, it seemed to work. Um, some people in the crowd started to encircle me and try to offer me some level of protection. Um, and they gave, you know, that provided me with like enough time or, or other officers, uh, specifically my partner, Jimmy Albright, enough time to get to me and get me the hell out of there uh, and back into the west front of the Capitol. Um, a lot of people have asked me, you know, my thoughts on uh, the individuals in the crowd that, um, you know, that helped me uh, or, or tried to offer some assistance. Uh, and I, I think kind of the conclusion I've come to is like, you know, thank you, but f- you for being there. But F you for being there. I mean, oh, man, you, you realize this is a police officer who was in fear of his life. It was a terrifying situation, just seconds away from uh, m- maybe mass casualty. And you know what? You know what strikes me, um, and either one of you can re- respond to this. That it wasn't that long ago that 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 Trump world was all about we back the blue, blue lives matter, we are the party of law and order, and yet here we are. The people fighting on behalf of the president of the United States are attacking the Capitol, 
and threatening the life of police officers in this in this way. Anybody want to talk about this? Because this this seems like a real paradox. People on the right who wrap themselves in the mantle of law and order have this this deadly contempt for police officers. Elizabeth, you want to take a shot at this one? I mean, it, it reminds me of um, <laughs> Stuart Stevens' book. It was all a lie. We've we've seen this over and over and over again. The president does not want to condemn domestic terrorism when it's coming from the right, but when you see protests uh, after George Floyd's murder and there's some violence associated with it, without any evidence, blames Antifa. Indictments later prove that, by the way, it wasn't Antifa that uh, targeted police officers. It was members of the Boogaloo Boys, again, from the right. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, launch a um, a domestic terrorism uh, designation against Antifa, which, by the way, the statute doesn't allow for, Mm -hmm. which, by the way, his counterterrorism experts for the last year prior had been arguing we should have a policy discussion about whether we needed a domestic terrorism statute to go after right-wing extremists. Now, all of a sudden, it's Antifa uh, that's, you know, know, ransacking our cities, so we need this designation, tries to force it through the system. The system pushes back and says, sorry, the law doesn't allow for it. Doesn't mind that at all. A few days before January 6th, he issues an executive order uh, trying to travel ban Antifa. This got lost in the shuffle of everything, but uh, they tried to travel ban Antifa and and then uh, direct DHS and DOJ to go ahead and designate Antifa as a domestic terrorist organization, which again, the law does not allow for because he wouldn't allow us to run a process to try to figure out how to strengthen our counterterrorism tools, all because uh, he's he's covering for for the the true extremists on the right. I I am I've reached the anger stage. I, I tend to be very clinical post uh, an event. I'm trying to understand what happened, but I am past that now. I am angry. I am angry that multiple people had warned that this was happening. I'm angry that he has so dismantled. Uh, our intelligence community, our national security community, our homeland security community, that they did not properly prepare for January 6th, even though there were plenty of warnings. And because of him and him alone, I, I, I'm not saying that there won't be blame to spread around and, and um, various bureaucracies for their failures on January 6th. But let's be clear, this is because he has created chaos, leadership change after leadership change, morale is sapped. And that's why we had utter security failure on January 6th. And it lands at his feet. He is responsible for the deaths. He is responsible for the violence that is probably to come. And yeah, like this whole law and order thing that he spent the the campaign on, that was all a lie. He could care less. He was using it to try to get himself reelected. I think his followers might at some level, genuinely believe it. But I mean, clearly, they're willing to throw that out uh, for the sake of of uh, overturning the election and uh, driving an insurrection. It's it's just mind boggling. So speaking of warnings, and you've been working on this for years, and I was trying to explain this to somebody that that there, there may be a sense of vindication that some people have, but also the sense of frustration because this was out in clean in 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 plain sight, and there had been these red flashing warnings. I just called up right before we started the podcast, um, a, a piece uh, in, in uh, National Public Radio. You went on National Public Radio in September and said that Donald Trump was pouring fuels on the fire of extreme of domestic extremism. And do you feel that? I mean, uh, un, un, until I, it feels almost as if until very, very recently, we didn't take this seriously at all. That that we have spent twenty years worried about Islamic extremism and terrorism, but the the presence of of domestic extremism and the role that the president has been playing really was below the radar screen, except for people like you, Elizabeth. Yeah, I I, I wouldn't say I feel vindicated at all. I feel extremely frustrated. Um, I feel uh, a sense of, of you know failure uh, that um, you know I w- I was on the watch for the last two years and wasn't able to successfully get people. Uh, to to take this threat seriously. So it it feels like failure, even though I've been trying Mm -hmm. to warn, Um, Mm -hmm. but extremely frustrated that uh, 
you know, for, for a variety of reasons that the warnings were not heeded. Um, and, and look, I mean, there were some successes. We made some progress. We, we have pushed forward some prevention efforts, got that funded, you know, a 1200% increase uh, in in budget, which is really unheard of. Uh, so there were some successes that will help us fight this threat. But some of the biggest issues that we needed to wrestle with the last four years really required leadership, really required the, the White House National Security Council to perform its functions. It refused to do that. It required the president calling what the threat what it is. That's the first thing you do when you are trying to develop a strategy to counter the enemy. You describe the threat. He refused to do that. In, in fact, he actually contributed to the threat because I think as you've heard other counterterrorism experts describe this, he is the spiritual leader of this movement. He is serving as the bin Laden type figure in inspiring them and giving them kind of their marching orders. So he is not only only, uh, you know, thwarted efforts to try to uh, protect the country from this growing threat. He actually uh, was, you know, the, the, I think we need to draw that parallel with what we experienced with Islamist terrorism. He is that bin Laden spiritual advisor figure for this movement, and he needs to be treated as such and held accountable. Olivia, you, you work very closely with uh, Vice President Mike Pence, and the, and the story of Mike Pence is, is really just one of the extraordinary uh, chapters of this of this whole saga. I, I I don't know whether I want to describe it as biblical or or Shakespearean, but the the, the loyal the loyalist of the loyal Trump uh, supp- supporters um, at, at at the end be betrayed. So, you know, the story that we have today is about one minute after the vice president was hustled out of the Senate chamber by the secret security uh, by the Secret Service and into a nearby room. Members of the pro Trump mob arrived at the top of a nearby landing, so it was really close. So I know it's hard, but what do you think is going through Mike Pence's mind? I mean, here's a guy who was willing to do anything, say anything for Donald Trump. And yet at the end, Donald Trump turns on him and the mob comes after him. I mean, wow. I think fear is fair to say, right? I mean, his family was there. His wife was there. And I think at that moment, I'm sure that he was processing the events. I think probably, honestly, I think emotionally, he was probably prepared for a moment like this where he knew that just carrying out his responsibilities and duties to certify the election and given the conversation he'd had with the president and telling him straight out that he is not going to be able to carry out the things that he claims he wants him and thinks that he can carry out, right? He doesn't have the authority to overturn the election. There's nothing he can do about that. And I think he, I can only imagine what he must have been thinking and knowing that the full wrath and fury of Trump would come his way after four years of standing next to this man loyally and unwavering. But having your life threatened like that and the life of congressional leadership around you and your own family, I I, mean, I know that it shook him. I could see it in the anger when he gave that speech later that I was going to say anger. A- a- anger and regret. To talk about that. I mean, you know, here, here's a guy who was really set up when you think about it. I mean, who, was, who made it clear that he would do anything. He would fall on any hand grenade. And then the president asked him to do something that was just absolutely impossible. And maybe at some level must have known it was absolutely impossible. So there's the fear. But then... Talk about the anger, though, because, I mean, people who, who who know Pence and you know Pence a lot better than I do were saying that you could just see that 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 he was he was upset that he was set up this way. He was definitely shook. I mean, he was visibly shaken. I have never seen him that angry publicly in the entire right. time I worked for him. And I worked for this man very closely for over two years. And I think that the emotion that you saw was real. I, he had just lived through this event, an event that he knows personally was driven and caused by the president, the person who sits no less than 50 feet away from him every single day when they're at work, right? Here is the president who has incited this situation, who leads to the calls of 
calling for Mike Pence's assassination and hanging. I mean, what a low point for our country and what a dangerous moment for our country, I would say, when you have the president enabling and inciting and encouraging this type of behavior that calls for the dangerous detriment and the assassination of the vice president. I mean, so, I mean, I think in Mike Pence's head, he's got to be sitting there going, well, uh, you know, everybody knows that you only make it so far in this administration. And at some point, it's not a matter of when it's a matter of, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when Trump's going to turn on you. So are there any regrets? Do you think he has any regrets for how this went and how it's ending? And, 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 and the kind of vice president that he was, sort of the waxwork loyalist over the last four years. I certainly think this is not the way Mike Pence saw this ending, right? I think he thought that he would sort of be able to ride this out and then just move past it and move on. And I honestly think plan for 2024, because it's no secret that he has had political ambitions to become president someday. And this is why he signs on to this ticket. Uh, given that this is where the party's base is, unfortunately, from what we've seen. But I can't imagine that he thinks back on all of the times that he stood by him when I know he didn't agree with a lot of the positions and the stances that were being taken. But he stands by and he follows and he publicly you know, praises him repeatedly over and over. Right? I can't tell you how how many eye rolls I must have done and how, oh gosh, how sick I was of hearing Mike Pence say, because of President Trump this, because Mm -hmm. of President Trump that. I mean, every single speech had that in it, right? I mean, look, I personally tried to take that out of his remarks sometimes. (laughs) The vice president himself would Sharpie it back in. He uses Sharpies for his speeches and he would notice that it wasn't in there and he would put it back in. And I think that says it all right there. I think that says that he knew who his boss was. He knew how to navigate the system so that he wouldn't get voted off the island and, you know, re- incur what and, many and, had and yet, and, and, yet, and yet here he is, although it is interesting that you know, he did not invoke the 25th Amendment, but he, there's sort of been a soft 25th Amendment being invoked. It, se- it seems as if he's the acting president right now that he's doing the duties and taking on the responsibilities of the president. Is, is that, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right. What did the president do to help any of these people when their lives were in danger at the Capitol? Mm. Nothing. He sat and he watched and you see photos and video of his family sort of dancing around and gleefully watching what is unfolding because they think that this is, what it is, right? This mob is is their support. No, I, 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 I could imagine that he was very angry. I imagine that he turned to mother at some point and said, "Fudge those guys." <laughs> so, okay, so Elizabeth, so Elizabeth, I, I want to get some sense of, of 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 how dangerous things are. How safe it are? I was going to say Washington D.C., but Washington D.C. seems locked down. So, how safe are we from this 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 fire that uh, Donald Trump has, has, has stoked. And you know, specifically, I heard you talking about, I mean, I saw you on Twitter uh, talking about the, the, the government's failure to issue the, uh, the NTAS, which stands for what? National Terrorism Advisory System. Okay. So why are they not activating that or issuing that? Yeah, let's let's put it into context. Um, for those uh, listeners that are old enough, you might remember the old color coded system, uh, you know, where Tom Ridge would get up and say we're at orange level or yellow level. Um, and it, it this replaced that it's a statutory directed system, uh, meaning Congress told the Department of Homeland Security to administer this public alert and warning system. Um, A lot of what you often hear in the press, and we've heard of this in recent days, are um, intelligence bulletins that get leaked. So the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, and DHS earlier this week put out a joint intelligence bulletin or a JIB. That goes to law enforcement partners and other homeland security officials throughout the country, uh, including critical infrastructure partners 
uh, who have security responsibility for um, for critical infrastructure. So uh, those bulletins, because they go out to literally tens of thousands of people, usually do get leaked to the media, usually get reported on. And that's where you've heard various things like, oh my goodness, uh, threats to all 50 state capitals, or we're treating this very seriously. But the INTAS is something separate. It is designed to be public. It's supposed to be the government's formal communication to the people that we're facing a heightened threat risk. And there's three levels. Um, the first level is just describing the environment that you're operating in. The second level is that we have a credible threat, but it's not specific. And the third level is we have a specific and credible threat. And all of this is publicly available on DHS.gov. And I also tweeted about it. What is remarkable about this particular moment is that I think we could have argued, based on DHS's homeland um, strategic homeland threat assessment that they issued in October, where they called out that the threat from violent white supremacist was one of the gravest in our country at the moment, uh, that certainly after we started sh seeing chatter after the election of people taking up arms, of militia talking about uh, you know, uh, we are, we already had multiple examples of militias willing to kidnap governors, for example. So there were enough things that happened in the fall and in the chatter that happened post-election. I would argue that we, they, that DHS should have been having a conversation about issuing an, an INTAS uh, uh, alert, which is that lowest level uh, alert, um, sometime in late November, December. Uh, but certainly in the lead up to January 6th, there should have been a joint intelligence bulletin to law enforcement. There was not. And you could have at that point also revisited whether we need an INTAS. Then the, the Capitol gets attacked. On the other side of that, there is now no excuse to not tell the American people what they just saw. We face a threat from domestic terrorists. They, uh, yes, there were um, uh, people there protesting, stop the steal that didn't intend violence, but there were a whole lot of people and it. The more information comes out, the more even today we're hearing uh, more evidence from the FBI and the US attorneys that they believe that people had intentions to kidnap and murder our, our law um, members of Congress, uh, intentions to go after uh, Vice President Pence. There were some extremely dangerous actors in that crowd that uh, were coordinated and had plans to do a lot worse than they were able to do. So given all of that, how are we not treating this the same way that we treated ISIS or the same way we treated uh, the killing of Soleimani? So uh, those are the two things that I think are, are useful reference points. In uh, November 2015, ISIS uh, conducted a coordinated attack in Paris. Everybody might remember mm -hmm. the the Bataclan Theater. And within a month of that attack, DHS issued their first INTAS uh, alert. And it basically described the threat environment and said, hey, we in the United States may be vulnerable to homegrown, radicalized ISIS supporters that could attempt to do something like they did in France. And that bulletin um, expires. They set an expiration date and, and it was re- issued every six months until I want to say it was 2019 that we decided to let it expire. It might have been 2020. Um, so that that type of uh, tool, while you look at it on its face and you might say, hey, everybody knows this, but it's a useful, and by the way, Congress told us to do it, useful way of communicating to the public how we assess the threat at this moment and, and encouraging the public to stay vigilant, see something, say something, be aware that there are people that will try to conduct mass attacks. And these are the various tools they might use to conduct those attacks. After Soleimani was killed uh, around this time last year, it took us two days. And in my view, it took us too long. A lot of institutional memory has been lost over the last few years in the Trump administration, but it took us two days to issue a, an NTAS alert. So here we are in this moment where it's, we have actually been attacked. It's not a threat. We have ha seen an attack. How they haven't issued one is mind boggling to me. And today on CNN, you know, the, the guy that is acting as the Deputy Homeland Security uh, Secretary, King uh, Cuccinelli, King Cuccinelli um, he noted that uh, they have decided not to do one at this time. Now, according to my former colleagues, I'd be interested to hear what Olivia is hearing. Um, a bulletin was drafted and uh, that Cuccinelli was actually supportive of issuing it. 
the authority belongs to the Department of Homeland Security. So I don't understand why it wasn't issued. Um, clearly, that there might have been some politics at play. Maybe the White House mm-hmm. told them not to issue it. Um, it but it, it's it's damning. Yet again, we are playing politics with our security, and there is no excuse for that. If you swore an oath to the Constitution, your your loyalty is not to protect a president. Your loyalty is to the Constitution and carrying out your duties of keeping us safe. So, Olivia, what are you hearing about this? Well, I don't think one, this administration has enabled this to happen right under their watch, right? We have, they have failed to condemn these types of movements repeatedly, starting with Charlottesville, from the Tree of Life synagogue shooting to the El Paso mass shooting, where I actually tried to get the vice president himself to travel down there instead of Trump. And I tried him to get him to actively condemn it pub- publicly, really? which he didn't, mm-hmm. right? He didn't. And so this has all been the enabling of what is happening here. But I will say this. I watched Ken Cuccinelli this morning. And if you watch that clip on CNN where he's talking, not once does he actually say the term white supremacy and rep supremacists. And not once does he condemn it. He skirts around it. And he talks about these elements, these elements, and he skirts around it. That is the language that the White House pushed last summer. That's the language they pushed through Chad Wolf, through Ken Cuccinelli to analysts at DHS, where they wanted the language shifted because they wanted it to leave the interpretation open so that they could push the net, the Antifa narrative instead of what really it truly really was, which were these movement movements exploiting these types of situations in situations like Portland. Right. So this has been happening repeatedly in the scenario. Elizabeth's absolutely right. And we watched the National Security Council do absolutely nothing. And I sat in the meetings with Elizabeth and they did nothing, right? Mm-hmm. So in terms of the bulletin, I have <laughs> I have no doubt that there is definitely some element of the politics behind the scenes where we will find out in the coming days that this was enabled, the people were complicit. And really, I mean, I don't call this an intelligence failure because really this is more of a failure to act and implement action based on the intelligence that was there. This is a really important point because there is a through line um, and all of these things had been building, building, building. Even before Donald Trump was elected president, people were talking about you know his winking support for uh, some of these extremist elements, uh, the way he gave them oxygen, the way he sort of um, you know was bringing them closer to the mainstream. And then you had Charlottesville, and Republicans did not stand up against him. Uh, you had uh, one event after another, and you 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 mentioned some of them, you know El Paso, and of course you know the the right media enablers rushed rushed forward and said, oh no, you know don't blame Donald Trump for all of this. I, I keep coming back to what happened in Michigan earlier this year, where we had a plot uncovered, um, a rather substantial plot to kidnap and perhaps murder the elected governor of the state of Michigan. And as a result of that, did Donald Trump back up? Did he back off? Did he lower the temperature? No, he, he kept he kept attacking her um, and he kept raising the stakes of all of this. And, and here we are right now. So Ken Cuccinelli, I only met Ken Cuccinelli once in my life. I met him at the Cleveland Convention in 19, um, I'm sorry, back in back in 2016, where he had just come off the floor where he led an anti-Trump floor movement um, and was shut down. So he's come a long way. Do you have any insight, by the way, into why Chad Wolf uh, resigned so abruptly? It seemed very odd that he had uh, issued an order earlier in the day uh, moving up the security planning for the inauguration and then resigned effective at midnight that night. I mean, he was an acting secretary. Um, and any any insight? Because I was like, what 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 is that about? Was he fired? Did he resign? Why, why would you resign a week and a half uh, before the inauguration at a time of such significant crisis? Yeah, it's um, it's the story of uh, DHS lawyers not being able to do their job very well. Um, so the very strange, um, arcane set of rules that govern uh, DHS order of succession. And there's the Vacancy Act, but there's also some specific rules in the in the Homeland Security Act, and and this both of which have been subject of several lawsuits yeah, over. Right. So so there's been this argument back and forth, whether he was legally the secretary to begin with. Um, but in particular, the 
uh, government's argument that he was legally allowed to be the secretary was based on the fact that there was a nomination pending before the Senate. Um, there's this rule that after a, uh, a vacancy of the last confirmed secretary, um, it, you can have 270 days to uh, have somebody serve as acting. And after that, you have to have somebody nominated. Well, you might have noticed, or perhaps not, um, when the new Congress came into session, of course, all of anybody's pending before the Senate that hadn't received a vote, yeah. um, their nominations are squashed. You have to renominate. And his name was in that renomination package that went up on Monday, uh, January 4th, uh, which is kind of weird, except for the fact that he had to be nominated to continue to serve, at mm -hmm. least under their legal argument. Um after the attack, uh, on his way back from the Middle East, he issued a statement that was uh, fairly, um, you know, for, for Chad Wolf, it was, it was uh, you know, a, a slap at the president. Um, it wasn't as hard as maybe it should have been, but it was still condemning his actions. Um, and shortly thereafter, I want to say within one to two hours, they pulled his nomination, yeah. which at that point meant he could no longer legally serve as secretary. So it seems like a couple of days went by where they okay. perhaps were arguing back and forth, but um, then he had to uh, step so in down. Effect, in, in effect, he was fired then by 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 pulling his nomination. Yeah. It was sort of a, a delayed reaction. So speaking of, of people who are having these last minute regrets, um, Olivia, you know you, 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 both you and, and and Elizabeth have left the the, the Trump administration. Um, have spoken out against uh, many of the things that they had done and talked about what you had seen. I'm interested in your thoughts watching all of these other Trump uh, aides leaving now, who have left since January sixth. Um, many of them saying we didn't sign up for this. This is too much. It's time to go. What what are you, what what are you thinking as as somebody who has been out for months and months and months and trying to ring the alarm? They're they're leaving, but they're leaving now with a week to go. Yeah, well, for a lot of the pe these people, they were going to lose their job anyways, right? In about right. seven days or whatever they were resigning from. And I, when I saw that, I, I have to say, I sat there and I was like, I was thinking to myself, really. This is finally when you draw the line after everything that we have all lived through, after everything we've seen, you actually stayed and wanted this guy to get reelected, right? That's not lost on me. Four more None years. Of them forward. They wanted four more years of this. What did they think four more years would bring? I mean, it's playing out right now. Thank goodness we don't have four more years of this guy sitting there in the oval. Thanks to the likes of everyone who came together to do everything they could to stop it. But if this hadn't happened at the Capitol, I find it a convenient off ramp for many of these people to say, oh, this is terrible. I think, you know, I'm going to resign. I can't stand for this. But you were actively campaigning and supporting this man in his quest to get reelected, fully knowing that this is who he is. I also uh, think that it's somewhat ironic that many of these people who are now resigning because they are shocked, shocked to find out that there's a sociopath in the Oval Office were the same folks that were saying that you and Elizabeth were traitors when you left early. I just, I, I'm guessing that's not lost on you. No, I absolutely, <laughs> I know, I know the sentiments and the anger that they, uh, they have expressed about people like me and Elizabeth. I know the things that people on the vice president's team have said about me, who, by the way, are now suddenly, uh, some of them are starting to reach out. They are really. Yeah. And are they saying, I'm sorry, we were wrong, you were right? I think most recently I, I did get a text saying, I can see why you felt the need to do what you did now. I feel like that says uh, a lot right there. This would require a lot of restraint from my thumbs if I was texting back with them. <laughs> so I, I want to get to impeachment in just a moment and, um, and, and also the Republican Accountability Project, which uh, is, I think, even more urgent given the vote that happened uh, last week. But w one more question, Elizabeth, that I wanted to ask that I forgot to ask you earlier. In terms of the 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 national security threat, um, what happened last week, but also the ongoing danger, one of the one of the most disturbing aspects is the evidence of at people who are either retired or active military who support this, people who are police officers. In Virginia, there was a, 
And there was a case of a police officer who had been trained as a sniper. So how significant is, th- is, is that problem for the military that, in fact, they have been infiltrated by these extremists and the white supremacists? How big a deal is that? It's a pretty significant problem. Uh, mm-hmm. We have seen uh, this since the 90s. Um, some say the, the military started to get serious about it in the 80s, but really... Uh, post um, Oklahoma City, um, you, you saw the military take some pretty significant steps to uh, up their game in terms of screening before somebody comes into military service. Um, classic examples: they look for tattoos that are associated with uh, an extremist movement. So um, it's not that they haven't had things in place to screen and they they, they uh, educate their recruits. And what's allowed and what's not allowed. But um, we had a, a recent story out of, I want to say the Military Times sometime in the uh, summer or fall that noted that uh, the average, you know, of, of, a, of a poll of, of people currently serving in the military, they were aware of, um, you know, at least uh, 25% were aware of somebody who had uh, an association or an affinity or an interest in uh, white supremacist or militia type mm. activity. So um, the problem persists. Um, it, it, it persists in two ways that we're aware of. We know that extremist groups encourage young recruits uh, like teenagers um, to, to, quote unquote, stay clean. I mean, don't get any tattoos. Don't put too much on your social media so that you can inf- go into the military and, and pass all of their vetting systems. Um, and then on the other side of getting that training, come, come and rejoin us. So you have that problem. And then you, on the other side, um, people leaving the military uh, who maybe were not predisposed um, to these various extremist movements beforehand, um, you know, there's some factors in leaving the military that um, can make one more vulnerable to recruitment. Uh, to be very clear, not everybody that leaves the military is vulnerable to this, but certain personality types, or certain people that have experienced certain risk factors can be more predisposed to recruitment. Mm-hmm. Um, so veterans affairs and, you know, uh, education of the community as a whole, uh, as to what to look for, the way that they recruit, um, as well as bystander type reporting, like, uh, educating a spouse, for example, on, um, what might be signs and indicators of somebody that is, uh, headed down that radicalization path. Those are all things that the military could probably strengthen. Um, and we, we also, you, you mentioned this, but, uh, law enforcement. We have a huge problem in the law enforcement community too. One of both unconscious bias, which at a minimum uh, was d- demonstrated in the lack of preparation on January 6th, um, but but also potentially uh, people on the inside who um, are uh, sympathetic or perhaps um, you know actually involved in some of these movements. Uh, so we have a, a challenge. Now, I, I don't want to overstate, and I've, t- I've compared notes with a handful of people that work at the FBI, for example, um, that are very concerned about these problems, it is not, you're not talking about like uh, a sizable majority that are white supremacist. It is, you know, a small minority that ha- that where this problem persists, but they can have an impact on the organization and the way that it carries out its duties. And of course, they are carrying out uh, their duties um, on behalf of the American people. So if they are uh, violating their oath of office it, um, and not keeping us safe, uh, willing to aid a domestic enemy, like that, those are all violations of the oath of office and they need yeah. to be treated seriously. So, uh, Olivia, I've been thinking about the you know various inflection points. The, the incident in Lafayette Square, I, I keep coming back to, as, as kind of a warning point, but also maybe a turning point, because I think you saw what uh, Donald Trump was capable of, the the, the use of, of really dramatic force against uh, otherwise peaceful protesters. But also, that seemed to be the moment that shocked the military. General Milley coming out and saying, I really, really regret that I was part of that, that I was walking around in fatigues. Uh, Mark Esper had been very much a loyalist to, to Donald Trump, but it was like, whoa, 
Uh, we do not want the military to be involved in this sort of thing. And you think about the way that uh, that the that the hierarchy of the military has made it very, very clear that there was no role for the military in the election. You think about that remarkable letter from all of the former secretaries of defense, that remarkable statement by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, which now certainly looks prescient, but very, very important to lay the line out that they were not going to allow the president of the United States to let the, to use the military to advance his his own cause. Um, this, this, that seemed to be significant. So do you, do you see it the same way that I think that, that Lafayette Square was kind of a, a warning about what Trump was capable of doing, but kind of a shock to the system of the U.S. military? I think so, right? When you, what you saw that day was basically what I would say it looked like it was a dictator's parade. Right. When he even is walking back and he has all of the law enforcement and military lined up next to him. That's really what I kept thinking about after he poses with the Bible in front of the church that had been, you know, set on fire. And I mean, he didn't pray. He didn't offer any words of unity or empathy or anything right at that moment. He just kind of stands there basking in the glow of what he has just done, right? And then the fact that he thinks that he can use our law enforcement and our military in whatever way he wants, in whatever, they're, they're his tools for enabling anything and everything, right? And so I think that it was striking to see, you know, the Joint Chiefs issue a memo, right? And watch former Secretaries of Defense issue that statement where they felt so compelled to actually write that. Yeah. Right at United. <laughs> That's a remarkable moment. I mean, we shouldn't just pass over this. They felt it was necessary to do that um, is one of those. We've come to this. Really, this is this is where we're at. So impeachment. Does it matter at this point whether or not Don, obviously Donald Trump is going to be allowed to stay in office? I'll ask you this first, Olivia. I mean, obviously, he's, he's, he's not going to leave office before the 20th. But does it matter? that the Senate convicts him and makes him and disqualifies him for future office? Or is it is it moot? Just talk to me about the significance in terms of this ongoing threat to national security and to our democracy. I think it absolutely matters to hold him accountable. We have to hold someone accountable who has basically actively tried to destroy our democracy directly, repeatedly, right? Who has caused danger to our congressional leadership, who has directly incited a lot of what has happened repeatedly. And so I think we you can't move forward. And what kind of message are you sending to the world, really, if you don't hold a man like this accountable? And, yeah. do, and I don't want him ever to come back and have the opportunity to run again. I don't think anybody actually in the Trump family should come anywhere near the White House or any position of leadership again, because they're all part of this entire scenario, right? Okay. You had Donald Trump Jr. saying things Every that they're happy too. Let's not forget him. Well, and also, though, you, you have, you know, the in, in the propagation of the big lie, you, you also had uh, other elected, uh, you, you had this universe that you're talking about, Rudy Giuliani, etc. But you also had elected officials. And uh, we saw last week, 138 members of the House of Representatives, two thirds of the House Republican caucus voting in favor of throwing out the electoral votes of one of the you know largest states in the country, Pennsylvania. And then the other day, you had uh, 10 Republicans who voted for impeachment, but 93% of Republicans voted against it. So Elizabeth, talk to me about the stress test, the once again, a, a stress test for the Republican Party. Are you in the camp of only 10 voted for impeachment? Or are you in the camp of, wow, 10, that is the largest number of representatives ever to vote to impeach a president of their own party? Sort of the glass half full thing. Yeah, yeah. I was playing along with you guys in the live stream the other night. And um, I really want I usually am glass half uh, full. Mm -hmm. I am very optimistic. Um, I, I cannot uh, say that I'm there at this moment. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that the 10 members had the courage to do the right thing. I'm devastated that 
we we have a, a Republican Party that views this through a political lens. Um, I guarantee you, if uh, the FBI came out after the, a Capitol attack and said, um, you know, this was inspired by ISIS or this was inspired by, you know, uh, I'll go back to the the Bin Laden example. You know, the, there would be unity in the Congress that we need to go after the head of the snake. And and to be clear, as we have all learned from Al Qaeda and ISIS, you can cut off the head of the snake, and you still have, uh, you know, a, a, a factions and extremists to deal with. But you don't not go after the one that is the primary uh, recruiter, the the one providing that uh, ration rationale for uh, why violence is acceptable. Um, you know, he Trump is. I, I heard another. Um, Counterterrorism professional Ali Soufan uh, referenced mm-hmm. that that Trump is like a uh, Anwar al awlaki If anybody remembers mm-hmm. him, um, he was one of the uh, you know really difficult case studies for counterterrorists because um, he would walk right up to the line of uh, of inciting violence and then back away. And we were trying to figure out how to legally deal with them. He eventually left the United States and was killed um, by a drone strike, which was very controversial. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I'll let legal scholars debate whether that was the right answer. But the, the point is, he is still one of the biggest recruiters, even after his death, um, because all of his videos still exist. And, and while the content was eventually taken down, they propagate through other means. So um, you really cannot overemphasize the power that the leader, the spiritual leader has in laying the groundwork and the case for uh, uh, mobilizing people to violence. So every single person that participated in propagating the big lie, um, while they are U.S. citizens and uh, we we obviously are going to treat them differently than we treated bin Laden, um, but uh, it, we need to treat them with the same gravity that we treated those that were recruiting terrorists mm-hmm. For Al Qaeda and ISIS, um, which means that the, the people that voted, um, whether it was some argument, Chip Roy really broke my heart, or, along with Amanda Carpenter's apparently, um, you know, I know Chip Roy, he's a good man. Um, th- this was not a moment to, to argue over the nuances of, of the way a, a, a something was written. The, the right answer was to say, uh, you know, this is condemned. You have to be removed right. from office, and uh, all the way to the others that were making justifications for how this was not constitutional or or whatever their f- fake arguments were. I mean, some actually had the nerve to get up there and still say that the election was stolen. I, I was you know, appalled. Well, and and and, 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 and that is and that and that again is the is is the vector for everything is this belief because you know I, I'm always tempted to use words like crazy and deranged um, and, and demented, but let's be honest about it. If people believe that the election was stolen, that their democracy has been stolen, that there was this deep corruption by people who want to destroy the United States, then it is a quasi rational decision to march on the Capitol and even to take up arms. People need to understand that if people believe sincerely that the president of the United States is telling them that their freedom and the independence of the country is at risk, then they think of themselves as patriots. And I'm, this is this is where. You know, Donald Trump can say, well, I'm against uh, violence, but you know, until he tells his supporters that, no, um, do- Joe Biden is the legitimate president of the United States. I lost in a fair and free election. This is out there. This is this poison's out there. So, Olivia, tell me a little bit about the Republican Accountability Project, because there are not a lot of Republicans so far who've been willing to be accountable here, apparently. Right. And I think that's the aim of the project is just to sort of say that we will help and support and back those principled Republicans, the few I would say right now and far that remain and fully knowing that moving forward, they're concerned, right? They're concerned about what the future of the Republican party is. What is the actual base of the party? And you've know, given the, what people like Donald Trump Jr. have said about, we'll be back. We're watching mm-hmm. you. We're going to come back, you know, in the primaries, we're going to do everything we can against you. You know, we saw Donald Trump at, down in Georgia say that he would be back in two years to actively campaign against the governor, right? I mean, there are these threats 
that are overt. And so I think in terms of the accountability project, we want we want to support those who actually uh, stand uh, for what's right and you know do vote their conscience. And I, 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 this moment. I think it's going to be one of those decisive moments when they come after people like Liz Cheney, when they try to primary her in Wyoming or when they try to go after the officials in various states who upheld the election. I think that's going to be that's going to be decisive about whether or not one of the two major political parties is has gone all in on 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 sedition. Elizabeth Newman, Olivia Troy, thank you so much. Uh, I think our listeners know Elizabeth Newman was a former senior advisor, deputy chief of staff to the Department of Homeland Security until she broke with the Trump administration. Olivia Troy until July, the Homeland Security advisor to Vice President Mike Pence. Both of them are working now uh, to uh, to establish the the Republican Accountability Project and. Thank you both for all of the warnings, um, and I know how frustrating it is, but but thank you for the warnings, and thank you for continuing to sort of shine a light on on what's been going on. So Elizabeth and uh, Olivia, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Charlie. Thank and, thank, and thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we will do this all over again.